Bible, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11. This morning I want to spend a few moments on a message entitled, There Ain't No Shame in This Name. Ain't no shame in this name. You know, I grew up in a family where nicknames were a sign of love. If you didn't have a nickname, you just weren't loved. Now, I've learned that I have to be careful with you guys because you're just plain cruel. You're mean. Because early on I shared with you that my family nickname is Iggy. I-G-G-Y. And after the first time I shared that, somebody met me in the vestibule and said, Good message, Pastor Iggy. Iggy. I don't know where that came from, but I knew that my family loved me because they called me Iggy. I looked online for some nicknames. How about Buttercup? Munchkin? Precious? Sweetums? Kathleen and I went to visit Bill and Charlotte Sneed this week and I was reminded that his nickname for Charlotte has been always Tootie. Tootie. How about Dimples? Or would you like to meet the lady that her nickname is Cruella? That's kind of scary. Or Hot Stuff. We use nicknames and we use them because we love each other. And there are signs and there are tokens of our love, but there's other names that we use and there's other names that we are called that are not meant necessarily to be something that draws you closer, but it may be just a definition of who we are, how we act, what we do. That name fits us. The Word of God in Acts chapter 11 gives you and me, if we believe in Jesus Christ, It gives you and me a name. And there ain't no shame in that name. Now, I don't want to see a show of hands, but I wonder how many people here this morning are Christians. Because, of course, we know that not everyone that comes to God's house is a believer. Not everyone has given their life to Jesus Christ. Not everyone has accepted the perfect sacrifice that he made for all of us at the cross of Calvary. But if you're here this morning and you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, you have a name. And I want you to know there ain't no shame in that name. And not only do you have a name, but you have a future. And you have an identity. And you have an absolute job and a responsibility that God has given to you and to me to live up to our name. I remember my dad when I was just a teenager and I'd get ready to go out at night. Occasionally he would tell me, don't discredit my name. You know, he had a name in the community. He wanted to make sure that we protected that name. You and I have a name. It's a precious name. It's a godly name. It's a name that has worth, it has value, it has wealth, and there ain't no shame in the name. Acts chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 23 through 26. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and they taught a great many people. Now I want you to pay attention to this very last portion of this sentence. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Loved ones, listen, whether we like it or we don't like it, we are known by who we belong to. I belong to my mother and my father. 
I, are from, I am from their lineage and their lineage. So we're known by who we belong to. We're known by what we do. And listen, sometimes we're known by what we don't do. We live in a label-oriented society, and we give everybody a label. There's conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, colored and Caucasian, American and immigrants, rich, poor, male, female. Names reflect certain attributes and certain characteristics of our personality. We used to have a man here at the church, and he called Kathleen Caffeine. Because he said she was just always on the go. She was just buzzed up on caffeine. And she, she doesn't even drink that much caffeine. That's natural, y'all. But instead of Kathleen, he called her caffeine. They're marks of identification in a name. They define certain criteria about us and certain characteristics. And in biblical times, names were associated with where you came from. We had Saul of Tarshish. We had Joseph of Arimathea. And in every case, the name assigned was an actual description for identification, for information, for interpretation, and for illustration. Names have a significance. I've shared this before with you. My daddy called me son because I'm so bright. What are y'all laughing for? You know, there's some interesting names in the Bible. In the book of Acts, we find Dorcas from Joppa. Probably where we got Dork from. In 2 Samuel, there was Dodo. In Genesis chapter 22, there were a pair of brothers, and their name was Uz and Buzz. I read about a a Sunday school teacher that had her class one day, and so she asked the question. She said, how many of you in here know the name of the mother of Jesus? And this little girl said, oh, me, 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 I know, I know, I know. Teacher said, yes. She said, Mary. The teacher said, that's wonderful, excellent. She said, I wonder if anybody here in the class knows the name of, of the father of Jesus. And boy, a little boy back in the corner, man, he puts his hand, he said, he's excited. And she said, yes, yes, what was the father of Jesus' name? And he said, that's an easy one, Verge. The teacher said, what? He said, his name was Verge. She said, what makes you think his name was Verge? He said, well, every time you read about it in the Bible, it's, it's, it's Virgin Mary. Names. Verge. Loved ones, we need to remember this morning that as children of God, we're given a name, and our name reflects our heritage, and our name is a reflection of our Heavenly Father. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. And that name is a mark of our identity. It tells our community, it tells the world who we belong to where we belong, what we ought to be doing, why we're doing it. And I want you to know this morning, there are a lot of people that claim that name that don't deserve it. There are a lot of people that make a profession, but they have absolutely no possession. That name that you and I carry is a name of Christian, and there is no shame in that name. And I want to make sure we understand it is not a Baptist name. And it's not a Methodist name. And it's not an Episcopalian name. And it's not a Catholic name. 
To be a Christian is to be like Christ. To be a Christian means that we are known for what we believe. Real Christians believe that God's Word is inspired and infallible. Real Christians believe in God's worth, that He is the absolute creator of the world. Real Christians believe in God's worthiness, that His salvation and His sanctification that He bought for us on the cross of Calvary is sufficient for you and me. We believe in God's Son. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. He was born of he was born of a virgin and the name wasn't Virge. He died a substitutionary death. He rose from the grave. He ascended to the heavens and he's coming again. We believe these facts are unavoidable, unquestionable and totally uncontested. And those who believe these things are called Christians. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 says, In Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Why were they called Christians? The Bible tells us they earned their name. They earned it because they believed in Jesus. They received from Jesus. They strived for Jesus. They thrived together as a congregation in Jesus. And to be a Christian is to be like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to walk like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus. And because they looked like Christ, they lived like Christ. So this morning, I want to explore our name. You and I have a name, and we're called Christians, and that name has a meaning. And not only does the name have a meaning, but the name has a responsibility. So this morning, let's explore our name, Christian. The first thing I notice in this passage of Scripture is that is a name of persecution. Look at verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen. These people had a name, they were called Christians, but they were persecuted. And the persecution caused them to be scattered. And Acts chapter 7 says Stephen was preaching the gospel. The Jews got offended, they grabbed him, threw him in jail. Later they took him outside the city and they stoned him. Now, this was their design. They wanted to destroy the church. They wanted to destroy those that were called Christians, but regardless of what they did, their destiny led to more dedication, more determination. Boy, there's a point to be made. I could stop and perch right there. How many times do we let a little persecution, or how many times do we let some problems and Trials and tribulations in our life cause us to fall away instead of draw to Him. God's Word says that these people that were called Christians became more determined. The more they were persecuted, the more they were dedicated. Listen to me, loved ones, there's a lesson in that for us. The more we go through life and the more trials and tribulations and situations and circumstances and consequences that we encounter, we ought to let those draw us closer to Jesus, not to take us away. Jesus warned us that the Christian Christian life is a whole lot more than pie in the sky after you die. It's a lot more than pudding and cream while we're here on this earth. It's persecution. It's pain. In John chapter 15, we read, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Paul told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be. Listen, listen, Loved ones, listen, to be called a Christian, it's tough. The world hates us. They hated Jesus. Amen? God's Word told us about it. 
The name Christian is a name of persecution. Our culture is critical about Christ. They're contrary to His cause. They have contempt for His church. They're cruel to Christianity. It's estimated that over 200 million Christians in 60 different countries are persecuted, imprisoned, and martyred every single year. I want you to hear me this morning. The United States of America is not far behind. Believers are marked by the world. America was founded on Judeo-Christian values, but now we're considered a post-Christian society. 48% of millennials, 18 to 28 years old, are atheistic and agnostic. 40% of Gen Xers, 30 to 40 years old, don't even participate in faith-based activities, and they don't practice principles of faith. Our government is increasingly hostile toward Christians. We found out just how important we were during COVID, didn't we? When the government said, the church is non-essential. I have news for you. It's ultra-essential. It's top-notch essential. It's number one essential. It's not secondary or tertiary. It's primary. But our government told us it's not essential. Prayer has been prohibited in government buildings. Our schools are required to teach a godless curriculum and, and go along with principles that show godless compliance. A couple of years ago, the mayor of Houston subpoenaed the sermons of five different pastors because the mayor was a lesbian. And she felt that these pastors had preached against that lifestyle. And she subpoenaed their messages in order to sue the pastor and the churches for preaching God's word. Listen to me this morning. The name Christian, it's a name of persecution. Never forget this critical fact, loved ones. Persecution has a godly purpose. Everything that was ever made, did you know my God didn't make anything bad? Nothing. Everything that was created was created, and everything created by Him is good. It has a good purpose. We ruin it. Amen? It's us that takes the things that He makes, that He made beautiful, and we make them ugly. We make them tawdry. We make them selfish. But God created everything for preparation. Everything for purification. Everything for our perfection. Philippians chapter 3 says, I count everything as lost because of the surprising, watch this, and surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And then when I drop down to Philippians 3 and verse 10, it says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. The name of Christian, it's a name of persecution. But there's no shame in that name. Not only is it a name of persecution, but I want you to know it's a name of proclamation. Verse 23, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain a proclamation is an order. It's a command. In medieval days, when the king made a decree, he had a person called a herald. And the king would give the decree to the herald, and it was the herald's job to go out before the people and say, Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And then he would proclaim 
what the king had given him. Loved ones, listen to me. As Christians, there's some proclamations that we need to be making. Proclamation by preaching. Look at verse 20. There were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Christians ought to be preaching to everybody, everywhere. And we ought to be preaching all the time. We ought to be preaching about the Son of God, the sole source of our salvation. Acts chapter 11 says, The hand of the Lord was with them. A great number who believed turned to the Lord. I want you to listen to me this morning. The the Lord uses organizations. He uses structures. He uses worship. He uses teaching. He uses Sunday school. He uses programs. But God's word says, He blesses the preaching of the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those that believe. Listen, there's a proclamation to be made by preaching, but even more importantly, there's a proclamation to be made by reaching. Acts chapter 4 says, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand. Got that? Stretch out your hand. There's a proclamation to be made by preaching, but there's a proclamation that you and I need to make as Christians by reaching. Reaching out to a lost world. Reaching out to those that are hurting. Reaching out to carry burdens. Reaching out to share loads. Reaching out to let somebody know they're loved. Reaching out to let them know they're not alone. Reaching out, it's a proclamation by reaching. St. Francis of Assisi is credited with making a statement, and I know Brother George McDonald and I have talked about this statement a lot, and I've used it in services. Preach the gospel at all times. And when absolutely necessary, use words. Hmm? Think about that. The way we're supposed to reach out, loved ones, listen. As Christians, the way we're supposed to reach out is with our lives. Our life ought to do the preaching for us. Our actions ought to say everything that ought to be said about us, and it ought to say everything that ought to be said about Jesus Christ. Amen? My life means something. And what people see me doing and what people see me not doing is critical. It's important. Real Christians believe in real service. Real service represents a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I like the words of Benjamin Franklin. He wrote these words, Well done is better than well said. Your words may show your wisdom, but I want you to know this morning, your works will show your intentions. To be a Christian means that we proclaim Christ by reaching out to the needy, reaching into the hurting, reaching over the hurdles, reaching under the hedges, surrendered to Christ, surrounded in His comfort, saturated in His care, selfless in His cause. I want you to listen to Jesus. Matthew chapter 20. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 25. Let's take a, man, let's pay attention to this. Because this is so critical, and it's so crucial. And as Christians, we miss it. We miss our responsibility. There's a responsibility to our name. Watch this. Matthew chapter 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. The blessing box. Amen? I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. 
I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. Boy, if they ever saw me naked, they'd be clothing me quick. Cover that guy up! Oh! There's some things we don't want to see. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And listen, and the king will answer them, truly I say unto you, as you did it unto the least of my brothers, you did it unto me. Amen? We need to make a proclamation by preaching, but we need to make a proclamation by reaching. Our actions as Christians ought to appear Christ-like. They should affirm our love. They should attend to the needy. They should assure the broken. They should assume burdens, and our name is empowered by our method. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And why were we created? It's right there. For good works. We have a responsibility. And we ought to walk in our responsibility. James chapter 2 says, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. I'll show you my faith by my work. I want you to hear me carefully this morning. We need to preach Jesus with our life. The world is crying out. They need someone to care. They need someone to bear. They need someone to share. And it's time for Christians to proclaim to the entire world, we have no shame in this name. We're proud of this name. We carry this name. We preach this name. We teach this name. We love in this name. We live in this name. We lift in this name. It is a name that was given to us from above every other name. We're Christians. The writer Helen Steiner Rice wrote, People need people and friends need friends. And we all need love for a full life depends. Not on vast riches or great acclaim, not on success or worldly fame, but just in knowing that somebody cares and holds us close in their thoughts and their prayers. For only the knowledge that we're understood makes everyday living feel wonderfully good. So loved ones, listen. We have a name of persecution. We have a name of proclamation, but we have a name of power. Amen? Power. I love that they use that this morning. There's power. There's power in the blood. Why is there power in the blood? Because it came from a name. It came from the name that's highly exalted above every name. And there's power in that name, just like there's power in his blood. It's a name of power. Verse 22, Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church that was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now I did a little geography research. And Antioch was in the Amanus Mountains of Syria. It was 7,000 396 miles from Jerusalem. Wow! That's a long way. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, did you know from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States, it's only 2,092 miles. Yet, we see the power of God take this church 7,396 miles. That's power. The Christians of Antioch, listen, we live in a technological society. 
And today we've got all kinds of tools that they never had back then. But listen, this church accomplished so much. They had so much power that I know they had to be famous on Facebook. They had a following on Twitter. They fellowshiped together on WeChat. No doubt they put their services on YouTube. Sunday school was on Instagram. They were wizards of the World Wide Web. Listen, the church in Antioch, I bet they had Hillsong leading worship. Joyce Meyer was teaching the ladies' Sunday school class. Jack Hiles was the Sunday school director. John Hagee was the head of missions. No doubt they had Benny Hinn as the in-house faith healer. Oral Roberts as their director of education. Jim Baker as facilities and finance. Jesse Duplantis was their travel coordinator. No doubt this church was seen live on TBN, CBN, SBN, and PTL. What a church! What an outreach! What Christians! What power! Listen to me, loved ones. Jesus didn't need any of that stuff. Over 7,000 miles he sent these people because they called Christians. And the power of Jesus Christ and the power of God was upon them. And it wasn't men's power that made them Christians. It was the power of God. Verse 21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. Listen to me this morning. The secret weapon of every Christian is the hand of God. We've got the hand of God upon us. And when the power of God makes you and me Christians, I want us to understand our name is marked with power. We have overwhelming power. We shouldn't be walking around defeated. We shouldn't be walking around worried and in fear and in doubt and disbelief. We have a name of power, and the evidence of his power in our life should be visible, viable, and vocal. And when it's that way, souls will be saved, lives will be changed, situations will be rearranged, circumstances will be exchanged. We need God's power in our life. We need God's power in our church. We need him preaching to us and teaching to us and reaching for us. We need him breathing into our spirit. We need him to break our hearts. We need him to bring conviction. We need him to bolster our worship. We need him to keep us close, and we need him to keep us clean. Look at God's power in Antioch. The power of God in Antioch exposes sin. I read the story about Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Everybody remember that story? Anybody who hadn't heard that story? Okay, because I don't want to leave anybody out. Ananias had sold some land. And he came to church on Sunday morning, and he was really going to impress everybody. So he gets up in front of the church, and he makes an announcement that I sold this land, and I brought all the money to the church. And he was lying like a dog. And he got called out on his lie. And not only did he get called out on his lie, but the power of God right there in the sanctuary struck him dead. He fell out in the middle of the sanctuary. Now here's what I thought about when I was getting ready for this message. God let your power show in our church that way. Can you imagine what it would do to you and me if we saw that take place right in front of us? If we saw the power of God move that way, what would it do in our heart? What would it do in our mind? What would it do in our life? How would it impact us? How would it change us? But then I remember about that story too. There's something else I want to point out. After Ananias lied and died... They carried him out, and they buried him behind the church. 
Now here's the point that I really like. In Acts chapter 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. Great fear came upon all that heard it. But then if we go through and we read the rest of the book of Acts in that particular story, it says three hours later, his wife, Sapphira, came to church. Three hours later. Three. Did you hear me? Three. They were still having church. Three hours later. I wonder how many of you would still be here if I was preaching three hours. Huh? I just wonder. We have people that complain about the fact now that one day a week they have to come for an hour. God help you if you go any further. But Sapphira came to church three hours later. That's my kind of church. I'm telling you. But Peter confronted Sapphira about the lie that Ananias had told. And just like a good wife, Sapphira backed her husband. And look at Acts chapter 5. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Lord? And then he told her, Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. And they're about to carry you out there too. And the Word of God says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 10, immediately, immediately, she fell down dead. And they carried her out, and they buried her with her husband. Now listen to me, loved ones. That's power that'll make you pucker. Amen? God, give us that power today. God, give us that power in our church. God, give us that power in our Christian life. God, give us that power in our comings. God, give us that power in our goings. The name of Christian is a name of power. We have unlimited power at our disposal. The power of God exposes sin just like it did with Ananias and Sapphira. But listen, the power of God exalts the servants. Acts chapter 4 says, As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. The power of God will make us preach Jesus. The power of God will make us praise Jesus for all reasons, in all seasons. And in verse 3 it says, And they arrested them and put them in custody till the next day. They took them to jail. But many of those who heard the word in verse 4 believed, and the number of them was about 5,000. Wow. The power of God. The power of God will make us oblivious to our pain. It will make us obsessive about gain. The power of God exposes sin. It exalts the servant. But listen, the power of God exhilarates the saved. Acts chapter 4 again. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Key in on that particular phrase in verse 24. They lifted their voices together to God. Salvation will always be marked by praise. Christians and those who are called Christians should always be known for praise. In every circumstance, in every situation, no matter what's going on in my life, the praise of my God ought to be on my tongue. I ought to be happy, joyous, and free. And I want you to hear, Henry Ford, who created that great car conglomerate, he had a little saying. 
I love it. I think we need it in our church. I may even get a banner. Put it up. Here's what Henry Ford said. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. But working together is success. I want you to listen to me this morning, church. We don't need a new plan today. We don't need a new process tomorrow. We don't need new platitudes next week. We don't need more new programs next month. Hear me, we need commitment now. And we ought to be committed to our name, the name of Christian, that means something, that's given to us from the name that's highly exalted above every name. And the power of God produces praise, and praise produces unity and purity and clarity and charity and serenity. We need commitment. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The power of God exposes sin. It exalts the servants. It exhilarates the saved. But listen, the power of God will excite the sanctuary. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great peace was upon them all. Listen to me, the power of God is fulfilling. The power of God is enriching. The power of God is sustaining. And in this passage of Scripture, I want us to pay real close attention to what it was that they gave. Watch this. Verse 34. For as many were owners of lands or houses, they sold them. And they brought the proceeds Got that? Doesn't say they brought a tenth of it, or half of it, or even three-fourths of it. The Bible says they brought the proceeds of what was sold. The proceeds. Everything they had. But I, I love the result. Because in that same passage of Scripture, in verse 34, we're given the result. There was not a needy person among them. You got that? They gave everything. And He gave everything. Everything they needed. Loved ones, remember, there ain't no shame in this name. It's the name of the highly exalted Son of God. To be Christ-like is to be everything. To be Christ-like is to extol virtue with God the Father. It's a name of persecution. It's a name of proclamation. It's a name of power. But now don't miss this point. It's a name of proof. Look at verse 26. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called first Christians at Antioch. The proof was in the pudding. Listen to me, church. Here's something we need to lock on to this morning. And we need to hold on to. The church in Acts chapter 2, the closer they grew spiritually, the more they grew numerically. 
I want you to think about that. We have churches, and, and I kind of came out of a denomination that did a lot of this. I want you to know something. I'm not big on Sunday school campaigns and, and you know, all kinds of gimmicks. To get, but we shouldn't need gimmicks in God's house. Amen? I'm glad my father didn't raise me about a gimmick having to do with Jesus. There are no gimmicks. I wonder sometimes what we're thinking, but I, but I kind of came out of a denomination that, that was all about promoting, promoting the church, promoting programs, promoting different things to try to, to, try to entice people to come to church. Look at this. God's Word's pretty clear. Real clear. I want you to, we got to key in on this. As a Christian family, we've got to understand this. The closer they grew spiritually, the more they grew numerically. If we want to see our church body grow, we need to grow spiritually. If we want to see our community grow and change, we need to grow spiritually. And we'll find that when we grow spiritually, we will grow numerically. Don't be a flash in the pan. Listen to me. Stick to the pan. Amen? Stick and be a part of God's church. Be a part of God's witness. Be a part of what He wants to do in your life. Be a part of what He wants to do in our community. Commit your name. Christian. Claim it. Care for it. Carry it everywhere you go. Cherish it. Challenge those who defy it. Convey it. Contend for that name. Be confident in that name. Celebrate your name in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Your name is highly exalted, it's highly extended, and it's supposed to be highly expended. Amen? You're supposed to do something with that name. Real Christians produce real fruit. Matthew chapter 7 says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Galatians chapter 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Have you inspected your fruit lately? Hmm? Some of us need to become expert fruit inspectors. Hey, amen? I'm just giving you God's Word. It doesn't come from me. You're named a Christian. I leave you this morning with this. There ain't no shame in that name. Amen? It's a name of persecution. It's a name of power. It's a name above every single name. It's a name that we're given to go out into the world and make a difference. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was cruised for our iniquity, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, the King James says by his stripes, we, and I want you to notice this, it doesn't say we were healed. We are healed. Why and how are we healed? It's that name. It's above every name. The name of Jesus Christ. Let Jesus give you his name. Amen? If you're listening to me this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you don't have his name. You are not of his lineage. You are not adopted into his family. You do not share his wealth. You will not share his life. But it's so easy 
to have his name. All I have to do is ask him. Just ask him. And I have it. And it's a name that ain't got no shame. Amen? I close with this passage of Scripture, John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. And then look at the last part of that. Even to them that believe on what? His name. We have a name. There ain't no shame in that name. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your goodness to us. We praise you for your mercy and your grace and your goodness. Father, thank you that you call us by your name that you've given us a name that Father in you we live and we breathe we exist we have all of the wonderful benefits that are ours because of your name Father if there's one among us one person listening around the world that doesn't have your name Father, would you draw them to you? Would you touch them? Would you change them? Father, there are those among us I know that are hurting, that are suffering in various ways. Some that belong to you, and Father, some that do not belong to you. But Father, regardless of what their circumstance or their situation is, there's power in your name. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that you would meet their need, that you would touch them, that you would heal them, and they'd never be the same. I ask it in that beautiful name, the name of Jesus.